Rule 311. We're tasked with finding the differential equations for this mass spring damper system. We need to identify all the efforts and flows on the bonds in this bond graph so that we, we can derive the differential equations by looking at both the primary and secondary conditions on each of the junctions. But to do so, we first need to assign causality to the bond graph. So let's zoom in a little bit here. If we're looking at the bond graph, we have here an effort source, two I elements, two C elements, and an R element. The C's represent the springs, the I's represent the masses and the effort source represents the external force. The R element represents the damper. So when assigning causality we first start with our sources. We have a single source. It's an effort source. So it will specify effort into the one junction. That doesn't propagate any further and there are no other sources. So then we will continue to the remaining elements starting with the energy storing elements, the I's and the C's. If I take the I element also attached to this one junction and place it in integral causality, it will specify the flow into the one junction. So if we have flow going into the one, the remaining bond must specify an effort. So the causality propagates to this intermediate bond. We go to the next energy storing element, let's say the C element, and place it in integral causality. That will specify the effort into the zero junction, and the causality will propagate all the way out to the remaining one junction. The next element is an I element. Placing it in integral causality will specify the remaining causal strokes, because it will give us the flow at this one junction. Now what we want to do is we want to identify the efforts and flows on all the energy storing elements. For a spring, which is a C element, the displacement has a velocity, which is the time rate of change of that displacement. And so that will be the flow. Here we have x1 dot. And the effort will be the force, which will be the stiffness times the displacement. For a mass, the effort is going to be the time rate of change of momentum. And the flow will be that momentum divided by the mass. Again, we have another spring, but this spring has a deflection that's between two moving points. So instead of using an absolute displacement, we'll use a delta 2 to indicate that this is a deflection or a relative displacement and delta 2 dot will be the relative velocity. K delta 2 will be the effort. And for the remaining I element we'll have P2 dot and P2 over M. Now, next what we need to do is in order to de determine our remaining efforts and flows on the intermediate bonds, we need to apply our primary and secondary conditions at each of the junctions. The first one junction on the left-hand side, primary condition is common flow, and that flow is specified by the I element. So all the remaining bonds immediately attached to that one junction will have the same flow. That means that one of our differential equations is simply x1 dot is equal to p1 over m. Knowing the velocity associated with the damper, we can multiply that velocity by the damping constant in order to determine the force that's lost in the damper. Our next junction is a zero junction, and 
the primary condition is common effort, and that effort is specified by the C element as K delta 2. So the attached bonds are going to have the force K delta 2. The last is a one junction, primary condition being common flow, or in this case, a common velocity, which is specified by the I element as P2 over M. So this will be P2 over M, and this will be P2 over M. We now know all the efforts and flows on all of our bonds. That will allow us then to derive the differential equations, the remaining differential equations, by applying the secondary condition at each junction. So we need a differential equation for x1 dot, p1 dot, delta 2 dot, and p2 dot. Remember, we need a differential equation for each energy storing element that ends up in integral causality. So, let's continue. If we start on the left hand side, we already have a differential equation for x1. So let's derive the differential equation for p1. That differential equation comes from the summation of forces at the one junction. If we sum forces at the one junction, what we find is we have k1x, we have, excuse me, kx1, which is negative because the power is out of the junction. We have p1 dot because is negative because the power is out of the junction. We have k delta 2, which is positive because power is into the junction. And we have B over M times P1, which is negative because the power is out of the junction. So when we sum, we end up with a minus K X1, a minus P1 dot, a positive K delta 2, and a negative B over M times P1 and that those must sum to zero. However, if we account for causality, the first force, the th third force, and the fourth force, that is minus kx1, positive k delta 2, and minus bp1, are all inputs used to calculate p1 dot as an output. Notice that the left, the right, and the bottom bonds are all effort into the one junction, and the top bond is effort out of the one junction. Therefore, solving for our output, which is P1 dot, we'll get P1 dot is equal to a minus K X1, a positive K delta 2, and a negative B over M times P1. So there's our first differential, or excuse me, our second differential equation. The first was X1 dot is equal to P1 over M. If we move to the zero junction and look at the secondary condition, that allows us to solve for the differential equation for delta 2. We have here at the zero junction a summation of flows, or in the case of a mechanical translation system, the calculation of a relative velocity. If we sum the flows without accounting for the causality, we have a minus P1 over M because the left bond is pointing away from the zero junction. We have a minus delta 2 dot because the top bond is pointing away from the junction and we have a positive P2 over M because the right bond is pointing towards the junction and these must sum to zero. Now accounting for causality here since we're summing flows we're interested 
and which flows are inputs into the zero junction. The flow from the left bond and the right bond are inputs, and the flow from the top bond is the output. Delta 2 dot is the output we're solving for. Therefore, delta 2 dot is equal to a minus P1 over M plus P2 over M. Now we've calculated our third differential equation. We have one fourth and final differential equation to solve for. That is P2 dot. P2 dot comes from the summation of forces that occurs at the rightmost one junction. The forces there are K delta 2, P2 dot, and F of T. We're going to subtract K delta 2 because the bond points away from the one junction. We're going to subtract P2 dot because the bond points away from the one junction. And we're going to add F of T because the bond points towards the one junction. And those must sum to zero. When we account for causality, here we're interested in which efforts are inputs into the one junction because we're summing efforts. The effort on the left bond and the right bond are inputs and the effort on the top bond is an output. So solving for the output, P2 dot is equal to a minus K delta 2 and a positive F of T. So, we have then four differential equations, and I'll highlight them here. Here's one, here's two, here's three, and four. This system has four energy storing elements, all in integral causality, and thus we have four differential equations. A differential equation for x1, for p1, for delta 2, and p2.